First thing we're going to do is start by standing. You can see Ralph has joined us. As you know, Ralph is my nickname for the cat. It's not his actual name. It's just the noise he makes when he meows. We're standing, <coughs> as I said, in my case, next to Ralph. Feet together or they can be slightly apart, but they should be level. <coughs> so if they are uh, apart, great, fine, that's no problem. And there are certain circumstances under which you would want them apart. But you mustn't have one turned out, one turned in, one forwards, one back. They should be parallel. The parallel line that we draw is through the middle of each foot rather than using the insteps or the outsteps. Then you're feeling into your feet, your arms by your sides, perhaps by lifting and landing several times. For me, I'm a lateral spreader. Over the years of yoga teacher training, I've noticed a lot of people seem to prefer back to front, stretching their feet. I've always preferred lateral and maybe that's just me. So you can try either, find which, which works for you in terms of beginning to hydrate, the body begins to bring a bit of movement, an energetic movement as well. The chest is buoyant, and that takes a little bit of time because you have to kind of um, let the shell of the evening, <laughs> of the night, kind of fall away. So the chest has this buoyancy, it's almost cracking through that shell of the other world of dreams and sleep. And then in addition, you can allow your pelvis to start drifting. So we've got several things going on. Feet moving in ways that are conducive to this coming round, this coming to this hydration. The chest buoyant beginning to crack the shell of the night, which might be still slightly covering one. And we've got the pelvis being allowed to drift as if it's bouncing off the edges of a ring. And using that movement, to feel the relationship between the feet, that they are becoming increasingly even between front and back, inside and outside. So it's a lovely process where you begin to feel the parts of yourself that are scattered come back together, they come home to roost. Now with the chest slowly breaking off the shell of the night, the arms begin to release by themselves. It's very, very natural. We don't want to bring too much self into our yoga practice, if at all, if any. And then gradually, as the arms release, the pectoralis release, which you can use as a meditation, you can focus on your chest. You can allow the arms to begin to turn to face forwards, the palms facing forward. Now that's a slow, lovely, organic process that can culminate in the arms turning further and further until they're ready to lift. At that point, do just that, lift them up, suck in that tummy <clears throat> and look for some height everywhere you can. Now at this point, other kinds of movements might come in like bending of the knees, which of course helps you to shimmy the pelvis and loosen the lumbar. Movements of your head might help to increase the flow the Vahi, as it's called in Sanskrit language, Sanskrit Bhasha, Sanskrit language. So you're looking for a flow. That light tone in the tummy feels investigative. You might even feel there's a little buoyancy on the pelvic floor, which I think is lovely. <laughs> lovely buoyancy on the pelvic floor. And then take a big wide circle to release. And your hands come back to prayer position. And further <clears throat> deep breaths at that point. Now I'm still allowing this sort of subtle movement because the aspiration is to tune in, isn't it? To tune in. Now you can step with your hands on your hips or jump depending on how the body feels this morning, but we're going to take the feet generously. Good job. Chest lifted, light tone in the tummy, light tone. So light, like you might see a dandelion seed, is light, it floats. That's what we mean by light here. Light in Sanskrit, lagu, opposites the Sanskrit word guru, which means heavy. Left toes in, right foot and leg out. Turn on the ball of the foot and finish off the turn on the heel. When you're turning the front foot, <laughs> that's the best way to do it. And then raise your lead arm. Light turn in the tummy again, it's reiterative. And it's meditative. It's, Gentle and spacious, inhale, exhale. 
coming down to your tree kunas, raising the top arm, breathing through the nose. Obviously, you don't have to raise the top arm. Sometimes you might find it needs a bit more hydration. You might want to extend the fingers and close them and extend them again, for example, or stretch the wrist. These things are all permissible. You might even prefer to have your hand on your hip. That's fine too. And some people like to bring their arm through the inside of the neck, which is a good practice to do occasionally, but not every time, uh, to stretch the chest more. That depends on how long your arms are too. Uh, so those are a few options. And coming up calmly, feet to the front, hands to the hips, <coughs> and just stand like a superhero. With my Vajrasati t-shirt on, I'm going to call myself Vajrasati man. I know it's not a very exciting superhero name, it's the best I can do at 7.30 in the morning. Bad toes turn in, front foot leg turns out on the ball of the foot first for the majority of the turn. It's only at the last moment that we finish off the turn on the heel, giving us what we want, which is heel to arch alignment. Stretch the arms, find the pelvic floor, find the pelvic floor. So that's really beautiful, actually, the beautiful thing to follow through to find the pelvic floor, because again, it tunes us out of all the stories. Best to start every day without any stories. Inhale, exhale, coming down. I quite like to uh, feel that my leg is supported as if there's energy coming forwards from behind. That helps to support the hamstrings as they stretch. So we can feel this myofascia and just plain fascia as well and superficial fascia hugging in to support the muscle. That's a meditative thing. You can't think about doing that. It doesn't work through thinking. It's a meditative thing. That's why we love yoga. It's meditative. Top arm, as I said, can be up or on the hip or uh, possibly even round on the uh, inner thigh. But you would need to have fairly long arms for that. And it doesn't suit everyone. It's not something I would recommend to do daily but it's something that's nice to do perhaps once or twice a week if that's uh, your arms are long enough. Okay, breathing easy. Okay, calmly coming up. <coughs> Powerful focus, isn't it? Utita, a tree konasana. We're coming into Parsha konasana. So here a block is often advantageous. So if you know you need a block, walk your feet towards each other. We're gonna place that block on the big toe side of the right foot. <clears throat> Truth is, most people will benefit from a block. We often have the option to rest the arm on the leg, but we're not doing that. We're coming down to the floor or a block. So that's going to be on the big toe side of your right foot. You're going to turn the right foot and leg out, the left toes in, heel to arch uh, alignment. Stretch the arms, lightly tone that tummy, release the roots of the neck. So it's all quite, for me anyway, and I hope for you too, kind of blissful actually, you know, releasing the roots of the neck because you, you know, what's causing tension in the roots of the neck is released as well. Inhale, exhale, bend your front knee. You might bend and extend it a few times to help it hydrate and play with the pose so that you hydrate everything that needs to be hydrated. And if you feel ready, come down to bring your hand on the inside of the leg on your block or possibly on the floor if you've got really long arms, perhaps. Short legs, long arms, that would do it. Breathe easy. Hopefully with your hand on your block, you might even have enough balance to lift your back heel and take your top arm up and over. All right, so lifting back heel obviously makes it a bit less stable, but it does give you more uh, freedom of movement for your uh, shoulder. And you can bring your foot back down again if you did lift it up because we just borrowed that extra space. Great, okay, come up, use your leg and use your inhalation. Well done. <coughs> Hands on those hips again. Breathing deep again, it's beginning to stir the pot. That's one way that I've described the process of Hatha Yoga in the past. Obviously everyone calls their classes Hatha Yoga or Hatha Yoga, which Hatha Yoga is not a Sanskrit word. There is no th sound in Sanskrit. Back toes turn in, front foot and leg turns out. But traditional hatha, hatha yoga is all about stirring the pot of energy. Heel to arch, breathing easy. 
So just checking that here with the arch. Obviously, you put your block where it needs to be for the second side. You're using a block, stretch and lift. Inhale, exhale, bend your knee and extend it. Feel both legs, play into both legs. There's tissue between the legs that can be stretched as well. And when you're ready, down you come, down to the floor, or probably better off on a block for nearly everybody, I would say. That's a good idea. Light tone in the tummy. Top arm can come up. And remember, if you feel you can balance, it does help to lift the back heel before stretching the top arm. It does help quite a bit to get a bit more range of motion, although it makes things excitingly wobbly. <laughs> but to counter that excitement, which is lovely, but if I want too much before eight o'clock in the morning, we can bring the heel back down again. Again, there's this beautiful, meditative, light tone in the tummy. It's super intimate. That's what's beautiful about yoga to me, is that it's so intimate. It's beautifully intimate. And it's moment time. It's like dancing around in, in the living moment, which itself is a sort of swirl or a dance. Okay, arm down, push into your leg. Come on up, it's a big pose. <coughs> Turn the feet to the front and walk the feet towards each other. Kick out or stretch out in any way that feels useful, right or good. Now, it's not a bad idea to use a chair for some of these next balancing poses, but you don't have to. So I'll give instructions for both using a chair and not. If you've got one really nearby, I would say use it. If you haven't, or you don't have a chair at all, I would say um, don't use it because you haven't got one. <clears throat> so if you're using a chair, you can have it either this way around with the chair back facing you or this way around with the chair seat facing you. Obviously, this is lower. You can make it exactly the right height for yourself with blocks or books or something stable that you can put on there. <clears throat> You're going to face the back of the chair, and I'll give you instructions. Obviously, you're facing nothing. If you haven't got a chair, that's fine. Facing the back of the chair, what you think, what you feel is leg length. So the best way to ascertain that is to let your spatial awareness switch on by looking between your feet and the chair back and forth a few times. And you'll get a feeling either in your belly or your chest or your throat, whether you're too far away or too close or just right. <laughs> now, if you're not <coughs> using a chair, raise up your right heel. And if you are using a chair, raise up the right heel. If you're not using a chair, reach through and hold your big toe and the other hand on the hip. If you are using a chair, extend your leg out and place your heel. Hopefully your spatial awareness is switched on. Uh, either way, if you're holding the big toe, you're welcome to experiment with extending the leg if you wish. Or if you're on the chair, raising your arms up without impinging on the roots of the neck. So that's a lovely thing to, to be requested to not impinge on the roots of the neck. Again, it's meditative. It's intimate. It's responsive rather than reactive. If you're still holding a big toe, uh, we can come down so easy by bending the leg. Otherwise, we're going to bring the leg back down from the chair, hands onto the hips. Catch a few deep breaths. It's called Utita Hasta Padamushtasana. Okay. Uh, anyone who wants to know pronunciations, that last part is Pardam Bhushtasana, and you're muted, so you can practice saying it if you wish. Pardam Bhushtasana. Okay. The first bit sounds like, uh, always sounds like uh, one of the goons from the goon show saying Pardam. Pardam? What did you say? Spike Milligan saying it. It's just a thing to make you raise up the other foot. And similarly, hold your big toe if you're doing that version, or extend your leg and place the foot. Be aware when you're placing your foot on the chair that your lower leg foot doesn't turn out, doesn't sneak its way out. We prefer, <coughs> where possible, nasal breathing. And the reason, of course, we prefer nasal breathing is because it hydrates the air as it comes in, it adds uh, moisture, it warms the air and it filters the air and it slows the air. So there's a few tick boxes. Don't forget if you're holding the big toe, you can 
Experiment with extending the leg a little or, or more. The breath is deep. The eyes, hopefully, are soft. There's not too much gripping around the buttocks. If you're raising your arms up with your foot on the chair, make sure the roots of the neck are following the principle of flow. Here and now, this principle of flow. This is a lovely principle to follow. So breathing through the nose, softening the roots of the neck, the principle of flow. Either take a big wide circle and bring your leg down or just bring your leg down. Take a deep breath, shake out, shimmy out. Okay. Put the chair to one side. We can do that. Adhumo Kaswanasana. Adhumo Kaswanasana. So, coming into Adhumo Kaswanasana, when you're ready, by padding your paws into the mat. And taking some deep breaths. Extend some energy through the lower back. Extend some energy through the lower back. So the first thing you need is adhesion. You really need the palms to grip well. That means getting a yoga mat that suits you, first of all, one you don't slip on. But even if you do slip, there are things you can do about it. There's liquid chalk, for example, that climbers use. That can be very helpful if you're someone who slips a lot. But also your visualization and your repetition of movement and the intention to bed your palms into the mat. Combine that with extension of your inner armpits. So if these instructions feel confusing, that's because you're using the wrong tools. You're using thinking and self and trying. These are the wrong tools, they don't work. What should you use instead? Feeling, you know? non-self, and simply doing, not trying. So you go beyond all the different ways in which we might procrastinate into this immediacy, med immediacy and meditation. Well done, come down, <coughs> as you know, you can sit with a block between the heels and buttocks. Rest one hand atop the other. This is Bhairavi Bhairava Mudra, also known as Dhyana or Dhyani Mudra. And breathing in a way that's generous. The Sanskrit and Pali word Dhyana means generosity. So two parts of uh, yoga are most often traditionally emphasized and they are dana, generosity, and shraddha, trust, faith, confidence. And you can probably figure out how closely related those two are. If you have a sense of trust, then you'll be really generous by nature. You know, you won't feel you need to cling and grasp because you have a sense of trust that what you need is ever revealing itself. So what you need in terms of information about the way things are is in the way things are. It's not in something you learn and then project onto reality. So we have to open up, open up to reality. Now we're going to release. If you've got any problems with your wrists, do this next pose on your forearms. Otherwise, this is actually beneficial for the wrists, I have to say, and sometimes even if there's a current problem with the wrist, it's beneficial. Let's see how you go. Starting on the hands and knees, stretching the legs back and simply lifting up. This is often called a Kumbhakasana or a Palankasana also. Yeah. Kumbhaka means an earthenware pot, like those kind of Greek urns that had a conical bottom so they laid on the floor so diagonally. So that, you can see that diagonal position. Palankasana just refers to this sort of straight line position, like a staff or a stick even. Breathing as you move left and right, forwards and backwards, so that you're sharing the load. One doesn't have to fatigue that quickly. It means you might feel the toes are even projecting you forwards and backwards occasionally. But you won't get this right unless it's a meditation. And you won't get it. You won't get a meditate if you are doing it. It goes beyond you and me. Okay. Nevertheless, probably tired, so we'll come down, rest in one hand on top of the other, and breathe in deep. Jaw soft, eyes soft, brain soft, 
throat, so you get the picture. Now we're going to take the knees a little way apart. Now, as I've said in the past, if you've got a block between the heels and buttocks, you definitely need <coughs> extra support ahead of you. Now I'll show you the relative positions, but actually you're, the chances are you're going to need more height than this. So I've got a block here and I've got a higher block here. But in reality, if you've got a block between your heel, uh, heels and buttocks, you could well find it better to have your hands on a chair and your head on a couple of really quite high stack of blocks, you know? So there's a whole uh, raft of variants, but we've got the knees apart, toes uh, together. I think it's nice to use a block like I've got even on the low, even if you haven't got a, a block between your heels and buttocks. We creep forwards. If you are using blocks, the principle is the further one is a bit higher than the nearer one. And of course we are yogins, so one of the ways we recognize our practice is through the principle of a padigraha. <clears throat> so a padigraha is made up of a, which means not, <coughs> pari, which means sort of really, and graha, which means grasping, not really grasping. Okay. So if you're not really grasping, then you must be trusting. There must be that sense of trust. If you are using blocks, as I said, uh, your head will go on one, the forehead, and your hands will go onto the further one. It's very, very good to use a support like that because of the way it stretches open your anterior spine. And of course, anyone who knows yoga subtle body anatomy will know very well that the anterior spine is the location, the projected location of the central channel. So it's very much something we're interested in opening for in tantric yoga for, for a set of reasons and then in hardly yoga for slightly different reasons, but the same you know, desire to open it. Of course, breath is our central guide. Happy time as it is to be in balas and child points will come up slowly, fairly slowly. And we're going to make sure we've got a belt. <clears throat> could be a dressing gown belt, could be your judo belt, it could be a scarf. You get the drift. I even used a tea towel the other day to sort of prove a point. You're going to lay on your back. And with your belt nearby and a support under your head as well. You just tilt this a little bit for a better view. So a support under your head as well. Great. Now your belt can be nearby, could be on your tummy. You'll probably naturally want to <coughs> lengthen your lower back with a couple of sort of tuck under actions. And you might want to rest your hands on your upper chest. And I don't know if this is the case for you, but I imagine it is that if you move your elbows, you'll move your shoulder blades. Well, that I know is the case for you. But you can, if you do it a few times in the right way, you can pull your shoulder blades into a position that when your elbows come down, you feel much more open, <laughs> much more comfortable much more allied to the pose, bonded to the pose, connected to the pose. And then we're just resting, breathing freely. And of course, as yogins, we're studying. So we have <coughs> this trilogy that describes, according to Patanjali Yoga, what Kriya Yoga is. So, of course, the word Kriya Yoga was reinvented by 
more recent uh, yoga teachers like Yogananda and people like that. But originally, going back to Tanjali, it meant Tapaswadya Yeshwara Kanitanani Kriya Yoga. Tapaswadya Tapas Swadhyaya and Ishwara Pranidhana. So passion for the subject, commitment, fever for the subject even. Deep fascination leading to deep fascination. That's what we call study. Deep fascination, profound fascination, powerful intimacy. Powerful intimacy, powerful, it just sort of pours through your energy body in a way that borders on overwhelming. That's how yoga should be powerful. You feel it coursing through every part of the body and allowing that. It's interesting to, to notice how subconsciously most of us keep putting a lid on our energy, our powerful energy coursing through our energy body. Yoga says, no, don't put a lid on it, let it move. Because that power is the source of true wisdom, because it's an expression of the interdependent field. Now we're going to take a strap or belt <coughs> or whatever you're using and raise up one foot. The belt goes to the front of the heel of that raised leg foot. Great. And then you, like me, might find it feels nice to move your foot against the strap in a variety of different ways. Forwards, backwards, it might slightly move left or right. But the whole point is, again, hydration, bringing energy through the leg, and bringing fluidity to the leg. So these deep breaths, soft eyes, Meditative moves. Meditative moves just means moves that create a feeling of absorption. Exactly the same sort of absorption that you experience every day for moments at a time when you come in from the cold and sip a hot drink, you know, or when you, you're know, kissed on the cheek by someone you like, or when you see sparkles on water, or whatever it is, you know, there's moments in every day. Okay, we'll keep this simple. <clears throat> We're going to bring that leg down and do pretty much the same thing with the other. So it goes straight up. We bring the strap around the front of the heel where the heel intersects with the foot arch. And similarly, we're going to move the foot against the strap in ways that feel well, that they gradually absorb you, gradually get soaked up into the experience. Because a lot of people like uh, swimming at the moment in freezing cold water. I have to admit, I'm not in that uh, particular gang, but I really understand why. And I pretty much know that there really, you know, there's no uh, avoiding being completely absorbed in your experience when you get into the ocean at this time of year or a lake or a river. Very, very popular during lockdown is, is wild swimming. And I totally get it. And it's exactly the same as yoga, but it's a very, it's a very hatha mode. Hatha literally means with force, meaning that the techniques of hatha yoga are very immediate. They have a lot of energy to them. So breathing into this, the jaw stuff. You might have heard of hatha being broken down as sun and moon. Well, that's something that happened later in the hatha tradition. It's not literal, it's just symbolic symbolically taking two uh, <coughs> syllables from a word and uh, associating them with the sun and the moon. Bringing your leg down and putting your belt to one side. Now we're going to <coughs> remove the support front of the head and replace it with our hands. Fingers interlaced. Taking some, well, hopefully really enjoyable deep breaths. by being willing to commit. So we don't necessarily need that ice cold water, the sudden and unavoidable, which is the utility of that method, I believe, the unavoidable nature of being absorbed in what's going on. 
that swimming in cold water brings people. You don't necessarily have to do that method. But you can still commit, you know, so committing to immersion in the moment as it is. does need to be as committed as those very brave cold water swimmers, you know, very, they're committed, right? They just commit. Right? You can do exactly the same, you can just commit. Now lift up <clears throat> your feet, lower back is close to the floor. Lift up the head, lower back is close to the floor. Breathing is through the nose. Jaw is soft, eyes are soft. So the present moment is like a field. Um, the, the moment sensations, when we talk about particle physics, of course, we talk about fields and particles. Particles, we could say, represent in our practice of yoga now, particular sensations, particular emotions, particular thoughts arise. But they're excitations in a field. <clears throat> and it's that field which we call in yoga the interdependent field that we're interested in rather than getting caught up in the particulars because the particulars arise in part just as they do in any field, in the electromagnetic field or the Higgs field or any other field, gravitational field. Now from here, we're going to extend one leg to about 45 <coughs> degrees relative to the floor, lower back intimate with the floor and then retract it and do the same on the other leg. So I say about 45 degrees. It doesn't have to be as low as that if it's more comfortable higher up. Very useful for the psoas. One more time in each leg. The psoas, you might feel from the inner groin stretch. That's really woken up by extending the leg. Last time, last leg. Keep that lower back close to the floor. Getting a bit of the shakes is okay, by the way. And then contract it. Head down, feet down, everyone deep breaths. You might even find some sighs are happening. You're really allowing. I think the word allow is really fundamental. It's interesting when I start the Zoom, it always says, do you want to allow, you know, the Zoom meeting? And I, I, I just love to see that word, allowing. I think it's a real key word in your yoga practice, in our yoga practice. Allow. And of course, most of us are trained, highly trained in the opposite and resist what we're taught in yoga allow. Now release your hands from behind your head and roll over. And if you've got the screen to one side, why not roll to face towards it? And we're going to bend the leg uh, that we're laying on this old chestnut, Shayana Marichasana. So the leg is bent. 90 degrees between your thigh and your tummy. That's one set of 90 degrees at right angle. And 90 degrees between your calf and your thigh. Another 90 degrees. And then we're going to lift up our back leg, our top leg, and look for space, openness in the inner groin by taking it up and possibly back. And I like to close my eyes because then I really concentrate on the space. I sometimes need to pulse the leg. I just do whatever's needed to make that space happen. Once you've got that sense of space, you're gonna bring your leg down with the space still there. So you have to be very honest to yourself, very thorough, and take as long as it takes. You have to, in, in a sense, go beyond thinking. So Patanjali says, Tat param purusha kya ter guna vai trishna. Tat param, that beyond, <laughs> that furthest short. Eventually, the leg will come down with the inner groin spacious, tummy sucked in, pushing down into your hands, turning down into your elbows, forearms, and wrists. This is a beautiful stretch and massage for the thorough columbar fascia. So, that's a sort of fancy word. Thorough columbar means thoracic area, that's the spine that correlates to your ribs. And lumbar is the spinal vertebrae beneath that and above the pelvis. So the thorough columbar fascia is the fascia 
or the connective tissue that connects to that area, but muscles like the latissimus dorsi need to get connecting to bedding. Okay, top leg on top of the bottom leg, curl up from the side, hold right on. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to repeat that, laying on the other side. So I like to swap which end of my feet and head around on the mat. Once you're there, once you bend the leg you're laying on, similarly, check for those 90 degrees between the calf and thigh, between the thigh and tummy. <laughs> you can have slightly less than 90 degrees between the thigh and tummy if you want, and you can have slightly more than 90 degrees between your calf and thigh. There's a little extra caveat if you want them. The <clears throat> top leg lifts, and you extend that inner groin with honesty. So you have a straight choice, right? Like the cold water swimmers, they have a straight choice. Hang on to your stories or get in that water. <laughs> but you can't do both at the same time. Similarly here, you know, open up the inner groin, look for spine space in the inner groin, or hold on to your stories and ideas about yourself. You can't do both. You have to make a straight choice. If you do one, you're not doing the other. One radio set can't be tuned into radio four and radio six simultaneously. <laughs> so playing with it, commit. This is the great purification that yoga brings through your commitment to spaciousness, through your faith and confidence that this is possible. You play until you find it and then you bring it down, you commit to it. You remain with that space in the inner groin, suck in the tummy, <clears throat> push into the floor, lift and turn, and then elbows, forearms, wrists on the floor, breathing deep, massaging you by soft brain, self. Get a deeper turn if you can, get a deeper turn if you can through the deep belly. <sighs> Yourself, brain, self, throat, self. And either you're in or you're out, either you're tuned into one radio station or another. So we could call one radio absorption, okay? and we could call the other uh, radio samskara radio habit or radio compulsion and if you're in one you're not in the other no. okay top leg on top of the bottom legs or about those radio station legs and coming up uh, from the side now we're going to sit <coughs> in a cross leg position and i'm going to show you sideways on because we are going to potentially forward fold now if you're someone who's you've got a bit of pain in the sacroiliac joint or you're a little stiffer in the hips Again, employ your chair. It's a great thing to use for anyone. Well, that also applies for if you're sitting on a block to do this sort of forward fold, use a chair in front of you, which you can either use to use the seat or the back, or you can turn the back for a higher lift, which is lovely like that. That's lovely. I, I, you know, I challenge anyone to not get, be able to get into yoga this way. Uh, alternatively, if you're someone who sits very comfortably cross-legged, you know, draw the butter push out the back, you might instead use a block, which you can, anyone can use, to bring first your hands onto it. So this is what we're doing with Sukhasana, and then we'll talk through it further in a moment, which we'll prepare. Stretching to a chair or stretching to a block, slowing ourselves down, even though you know, I can easily bring my head to the floor, some of you can, obviously some of us, you know, just that's not going to be a possibility. And it really doesn't matter one job. It's not more yogic to have your head closer to the floor. It's more yogic to use your body as a portal for absorption, period, or full stop. So up on the block or up on the chair, perhaps you'll find a bit of rocking helps to sort of break down the resistance that resists the energy drawing into the hips, into the buttocks, which is where we want it. We want it to soak in to the hips, to soak in to the buttocks. 
And that's a really lovely feeling. And in some cases, what happens, and it really isn't part of the requirement of the pose on any level, in some cases, the whole thing melts forwards without the yogi even noticing it. She's not thinking in any way about that, not even on a subconscious compulsive level. But she might find herself further forward or himself further forward, in which case one could use the block for one's head. <laughs> on the higher setting, uh, better to have it diagonally positioned, and it's quite good to stabilize that with your hand. And obviously, as the pelvis releases, it may be that it's correct for you to lower the block. But what's correct, what's yogic, is absorption. And actually, a great yogini gets more and more from less and less. So that's a sign of your practice being more sophisticated. You don't need stronger sensations. You can enter into this, the bliss of absorption with a soft breeze touching your cheek, you know. Boom. You've gone into the interdependent field. So that's, you know, how we really judge success. And there is such a thing as success. It's even a Sanskrit word, city, which means success in yoga by absorption levels. Now coming up, the wave went down, using the block, using the chair, taking it slow. Well done, well done. And you can probably guess, we're gonna change the cross of the legs. So the other leg's gonna come in front. <coughs> We've still got a gap between the legs and pelvis. Highly recommend, you know, choosing a chair is, is great for anyone. You know, it, it may be that your hips are set quite externally rotated and that forward folding is easy. <coughs> it, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get more out of it by coming into it more quickly. So up to the chair or to the block. Because again, it's not just about, well, it's not at all about uh, external targets. Huh? And this is where we sometimes hear people say, yoga is not competitive, there's nowhere to get to. That's not quite right. I mean, it's not competitive, that's right. But there is somewhere to get to. You know? And that's absorption in the interdependent field. That's the whole point of yoga, mm. because when absorbed, what is truly owned by that field, which we also sometimes call the goddess, the Devi, who has many aspects, <clears throat> what's truly owned by that field, thoughts, emotions, physical sensations, we misidentify oftentimes as mind. <clears throat> but it actually, thoughts belong to the independent field. They don't pop out of a vacuum. Nobody has uh, independent thoughts. No one does anything independently. <clears throat> so any praise that's due to you is due to the entire field. And any scorn that's due to you is due to the entire field. It's not an excuse for bad behavior, of course. <clears throat> Because the way to negate bad behavior is not to abstain from feeling bad things and to only feel good things, <laughs> but it's to disassociate <clears throat> the sense of me, myself, and I from negative emotions like jealousy or ill will or anger. They're going to occur in every being, they occur in the Buddha <clears throat> because thoughts, feelings, emotions are interdependent. <clears throat> But the Buddha didn't touch them. <laughs> he had supreme perspective. They were there. <clears throat> but he was aware of an infinitely wide field in which they took place. And so didn't feel attached to them. So this is where we can get it wrong. We can start thinking, I've got to only think nice thoughts. I must never think anything unpleasant. Mustn't ever get cross. <clears throat> that just makes you uh, hide from yourself, and that, can, that conduces to a lot of problems. <clears throat> a couple more breaths where you are. We've gone through 
various stages you might be already have gone through, various stations, I should say. <clears throat> Let this absorb you, encourage this to soak you into it. For the cold water swimmer, it's unavoidable and it's immediate. <clears throat> that, in a sense, is yoga. But there are some advantages in also doing it more slowly and more willingly, because otherwise you become dependent on a certain method. <clears throat> Whereas if you understand what's happening, you can absorb into the infinite through infinite modes or methods. <clears throat> Coming back up, slow and easy, well done everyone. Beautiful, such an important and wonderful um, posture, I think. We're going <clears> to <throat> come into Adam Kishwanasana again. So I'm going to move my chair. Maybe if you've got a chair, you can move yours too. <clears throat> Popping up into your downward facing dog when you're ready. Padding those paws into the deepest we you can. So <clears throat> the molecules, the collections of atoms, both in your hands and in the mat weave into each other, bed into each other. That's a meditation and something you can conduce to through physical movement. <clears throat> so yogis, of course, so realize that for uh, views, darshana, as it's called in Sanskrit, views on the universe, to really relate to the universe, <clears throat> we have to relate those views in terms of our ordinary experience of the body and the breath. <clears throat> and this is the foundation of yoga. Feel free to move left, right. Feel free to bend, extend the legs. Whatever works. Sometimes I like to take one foot towards the other. That works pretty well for me. So the stretch goes through one leg on its own. There's a lot of things you can do, but open the armpits and send energy through the lumbar. Measure the inner armpits with the outer arms. Heels back, gluteal creases forwards. Groins open, thighs up. Okay, well done. Come down and all the way down, in fact, to your tummy. Take your time so it's not a rough ride. And prop yourself up on your elbows. <clears throat> Very useful. Just spend a bit of time every day just propped up on your elbows. <clears throat> Problems to do with the discs are avoided <clears throat> or even assisted, even repaired through this kind of movement. Now you can also stretch your legs or flick your legs back a few times to really make sure there's some space. Really make sure there's some space for the inner groin. Stretch your tummy by using traction on your forearm. Stretch your tummy as you move it. And feel that you're massaging into so many of these fibers and tissues and really extending beautifully. Jaw soft, eyes soft, throat soft, brain soft. So it's worth spending a bit of time on this. Now we're going to come down, rest one hand on the other, rest the head, and take some deep breaths. See if you can feel the buttocks releasing away from each other. Rolling over onto your side, <clears throat> support yourself on your side, supporting your head with your hand and extending your bottom ribs a few times. Very simple, very effective. <clears throat> so you're on your side, you're pressing into the floor, extending your bottom ribs, also extend your armpit <clears throat> and allow a bit of movement. So you might massage into the floor. 
which I think is just lovely. Rolling forwards, rolling backwards, <clears throat> massaging into the floor. And, and sometimes you get moments that just, well, you can't speak, you go beyond thinking. Unamani is a word that appears in a lot of Hatha yoga texts. Unamani. Beyond thinking into, well, what is it? You know, it is it is what it is. It's, as Arjun Sumedho, the great Theravadan Buddhist teacher says, it's like this. It's like this. This is what it is. <laughs> now, if you're ready, you can bend your top leg and play between the horizontal and vertical planes. There's several ways to approach this. You might want to go straight for the vertical plane or straight for the horizontal or straight for somewhere in between. <clears throat> We're just massaging the adductor tissue and the myofascia of the adductors, the inner thighs, until it feels softer. And eventually we want to alight with the knee pointing out without tension forming around the buttocks and the tailbone. So there's a sort of psychophysical calmness uh, around areas like the sacroiliac Joint. That's the joint there where the, the sacrum and the ilium, which is one of the largest bones, well, it's the largest bone in the uh, out of the three bones that form the hip bones, and the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And then when you feel ready, it adds an element of excitement when you reach for the big toe, I think. And then you can hold the big toe with your index finger, middle finger, and thumb. And then extend the leg a little or a little more as you like. Of course, it's very important to understand that more isn't better. <laughs> but absorption is what we're going for. So sometimes less is more absorbing. That's what makes you a great yogi, that you'll sometimes know, okay, back going backwards is the thing to do, not forwards. That's what makes you a great yogi. <clears throat> of course, this kind of yogic attitude will have positive implications for even the wider society. <clears throat> this sort of model of constant progress well, <laughs> gets to a point where it can be problematic. <clears throat> so sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. <laughs> okay, well done, release and place and draw the knees up. <clears throat> and curl up, nice and easy from the side. We're obviously going to go down and do the same thing on the other side. So when you're ready, you can position yourself down. <clears throat> and take a few moments to extend the bottom ribs. I love that part of the pose. So extend your bottom ribs and extend your armpit. Go for those actions a few times. When ready, <coughs> excuse me, the top leg comes up. <coughs> and <coughs> moving between the horizontal and vertical planes with a clear purpose, <coughs> which is to loosen up in a way that just feels, just feels great, actually. Just feels lovely. So loosening up. Breathing deep. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when you get to a point where you feel really loose and open, reach for the big toe and experiment. Maybe you extend a little, maybe you retract a little. You're looking for the same thing every time. Absorption. <clears throat> Sometimes just being still. <clears throat> it's the right thing, just being still. <clears throat> and other times moving is the right thing. But you can tell predominantly through the breath. The breath is the best mirror of all.
Long time. Come down, <clears throat> slow and easy. Draw up the knees and bring your body up. <clears throat> We're gonna sit as we often do at the end in Siddhasana, but <clears throat> and as I've suggested before, you can sit in alternate uh, sitting positions like Sukhasana, Girasana, Vajrasana, Padmasana, or in a chair uh, with the chair positioned at a slight angle. So those poses, Virasana is hero pose, Vajrasana is lightning bolt pose, Sukhasana is an uh, easy pose, <clears throat> Padmasana, lotus pose, other Padmasana half lotus. All this Siddhasana, heels aligned with each other. Chest lifted. I use funny as well to draw the buttock flesh out from the back. You see, I do it from the, the sort of where the buttock and thigh meet. That, that works well for me. Uh, we all have different, slightly different ratios of flesh on the body. So get it right for you. <clears throat> and the chest lifted. And the attention into the heart center. So breathing into this heart center. Imagine a blue sphere of light in the heart center, causing the heart center to expand from the center to the front, from the center to the back, from the center below and above and left and right. And in that, in the middle of that, is a golden lotus flower that is soothed into opening through your breath, which comes and goes like gentle waves that really naturally encourages this lotus flower to profoundly and deeply open. It represents your own heart. And we're going to place into this open lotus flower a scintillating white light ohm. <clears throat> so there's blue light, golden lotus flower, white scintillating with white light ohm. And we place it as we chant it. And it will be placed there all day. The practice is called nyasa. Nyasa, which we speak, made uh, commonly known through vinyasa. <clears throat> so bring your hands to the heart area, visualize to the ex whatever extent you can. And as you chant, tell yourself, feel that you're actually placing that arm and that that scintillating arm will be there all day. Take a deep breath and inhale. Oh. Deep breaths at the end. For a really good nyasa practice, you'd stay feeling that one. Maybe bedding itself in, scintillating in the very middle. <clears throat> Continue to feel it, therefore, as you release your hands. And we're going to lay down just for a minute. Um, you can lay longer, of course, if you have longer, but <clears throat> I try to be pretty strict with the timing on this morning class. I've got plans for uh, these morning classes after lockdown to make more of them. Uh, so that would be good. Great. Make sure you're as comfy as you possibly can be.
seeing all beings wishing to be happy as oneself. Let her practice love to all beings as follows. May I always be happy and be free from ill. So be my friends and people I'm indifferent to and people I find difficult. May the beings of this village always be happy. So be those of foreign lands and of other worlds. Countless beings and living creatures all over all the worlds, all persons, all creatures, and all that have come to exist. And all those of male and female kind, all worthy and unworthy ones, all in 10 directions, including gods, men, and unhappy ones. May they all be happy. May they all be free from ill. Now, if you are someone who uh, is, does need to um, move, then follow the instructions. Uh, but if you're someone who has a few more minutes and you just think, you know what, I am having myself an importantly good time here, then please continue to lay. So these instructions for anyone who needs to move, wiggle the toes and move the ankles and fingers and wrists. And bend up the legs when you're ready, tuck under the buttocks. Take a deep breath, let the lower back rest into the floor, bliss. Take a few deep breaths. Roll to your left. <laughs> Drawing the knees up to the tummy, tummy soft. That's a nice feeling actually. Hmm. Roll to your right in your own time. And when you're ready to come up, you can stretch out an arm or a leg or rub your eyes or whatever you need to do to bring yourself up nice and easy. I'm so grateful to see you so many times and, you know, through into this 2021. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Oh. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, Sabi, Martina, oh, Emanuela, Lindsay, Sally, Amy, Gemma, Nicholas, Amanda, Kyla, Emma, Tash, Stella and Tony. Thank you. I, Sa Sally, did I say Sally? I can't remember what I've said now. I, all of you, I, if I haven't said your name, I'm sorry. I forgot where I've gone through. Mwah. I want to bless you. Bless you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. See you maybe tomorrow. Be good. Try and be good. Ciao for now. <laughs>